Thank you, everyone, for your patience, and welcome to the third in our series of monthly webinars on different aspects of thermal management. This month's topic is selecting and designing liquid cold plates for deployment in electronic systems, and it will be presented by Dr. Kavi Azar, CEO and founder of Advanced Thermal Solutions, Inc., and a world-renowned expert on the thermal management of electronics. So now I'll turn things over to Dr. Azar to begin our webinar on liquid cooling. Uh, hi, Josh. Thank you for the introduction, and hi, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, wherever you guys are. We have a large audience from across the globe, and it is an honor and pleasure to be in front of you again. We're going to be talking about the electronics uh, cooling with the deployment of the uh, cold plates in it and uh, all the aspects associated with the cold plate. So I'm going to be showing you a lot of data. I'm going to show you charts and so forth. So I hope you have your cup of coffee ready. And I'm, I'm going to promise not to put you to sleep, but... Uh, I want you to stay with me. Let me try to jump into uh, uh, design selection for uh, electronic cooling as far as the cold plates are concerned. So I'm going to talk about the junction temperature importance, uh, power trends that, are, that shows why people are gravitating towards liquid, uh, cooling schemes that are available for options that we have to do. I'll talk about the liquid cooling, uh, cold plate calculations. This is going to be a cornerstone of, of our presentation today. I'm going to show you analytical models that we're going to effectively uh, uh, simulate to, to get a, a, a lot of design data for a variety of applications. And then we look at the uh, analytical model in comparison to, uh, to CFT model simulations that we've done. And then uh, this comparison would give us the conclusion that we have to go in order to be able to design a system properly for our applications. When we talk about the... Uh, electronic schooling, from my perspective, some others may disagree with me, the most important parameter that you have to work with is the uh, uh, junction temperature. And the junction temperature must stay below a set limit that is designed, that's specified by the, uh, by the uh, manufacturer. 125, 85, 190 degrees C, it all depends upon what the component rating is. Another very important parameter that junction temperature comes into play is the issue of the reliability. Uh, performance, uh, cost, uh, and uh, uh, device life expectancy. You can see that uh, the, the, the life is exponentially related to the temperature, and that's really important for us to pay attention to. So manipulating, minimizing the, the, the rise of junction temperature and making sure that it's as low as possible and we can determine it more, more accurately really plays a very, very important role in our uh, uh, design of the cooling system and the electronics that we have to deploy. Obviously, if we're not able to uh, ascertain the junction temperature accurately, we're going to be facing either uh, unreliable system or we put an uh, over uh, cooling capacity in, in, our, in our electronics that increases the cost, makes us less competitive in this highly, highly, highly competitive market. It is very difficult to see a product that's so unique that nobody else has a competition. There, there are so many different uh, options out there in the market that we have to uh, make sure that our product is out there right the first time. And uh, junction temperature and thermal management plays a really uh, cornerstone role in this in this process. So uh, this is uh, the old data uh, uh, from the U.S. Air Force. You can see that the major causes of electronics failure is, is certainly temperature. And humidity plays a role right there, right there with it. And then other issues like vibration, like dust and so forth, uh, have, a, have a contribution. But certainly temperature is the biggest source of failure. So management of temperature, minimization of the junction temperature has a more successful outcome as far as your product is concerned. And the power trend, I think, is an old story now, as I've put uh, some uh, examples from the uh, uh, early 2000, and, and you can see the trends that are going up, and a lot of the devices that we, we are working with, and it's a very, very varied market in comparison to the past that we had the, uh, the, the CPUs and the GPUs were, were the drivers of the, all the thermal management activities. Now we see the spectrum across the 16 different market sectors of uh, electronics uh, packaging. And uh, the demand is very high. The, the, the packaging is getting a lot more a lot more complex, as you can see here. The frequency of the devices that are going up, the power dissipation is, is on, the, on the rapid rise. And uh, we here at ATS, we see a lot of our customers are uh, challenged between 150 to 300 watts per centimeter squared of power dissipation that they need to find a cooling solution with. So cooling becomes a, has become a, even more of a 
a gating factor than before. And uh, this proper selection plays an important role in coming up with a solution for equipment. And the chip technology trend is not stopping. Again, I've, I've put a, tried to pull in the best data that I could find from different sources. And you can see that the uh, a number of devices per, uh, per chip is increasing dramatically. This is a 2007 data. And this is very instructive. As you can see, the number of uh, cores, you can see the typical power, you can see the frequency. And this is really very good to note. And I'm going to come back to it in, the, in a, in a uh, second. Then the number of transistors per, per device, it's everything is on the exponential rise. But what's important about the frequency, these two sort of uh, touch each other very directly. Uh, it is very similar to a, a car on the highway. If I go faster, my gas mileage, uh, uh, my, uh, miles per gas per gallon uh, is uh, lessened as a result of it. And here, as I increase the frequency, my power goes up. So I have, I have a very uh, tough challenge here because the market is demanding faster and faster product. They're demanding immediate access, immediate information, etc. And uh, now the power is going up as rapidly as possible. In parallel with that, we see that the, uh, the uh, uh, packaging is getting more and more complex in comparison to the past, where we had the DIP and, and PGA and PLCC packages. Now we see 2D and 3D packages that are in, involved, 2.5D uh, and, and 3D packages that are involved in a very, very complex packaging in order to make sure that the uh, functionality that we're looking for here is, uh, is uh, uh, available to us. And... Uh, when you look at the broad spectrum of electronic schooling uh, uh, sectors, uh, irrespective of where you are, medical or biomedical, aerospace, avionics, military, telecom, datacom centers, uh, supercomputers, automotive, that's getting a lot of attention. These two markets are very hot, uh, the, the medical and, and automotive. And uh, irrespective of the market sector, the thermal changes may require higher capacity cooling option. Hence, uh, people are migrating from air cooling to liquid cooling. Having said that, we, we should not take this step very blindly. Uh, when we go to liquid cooling and, and liquid cooling applications, anybody who's dealt with liquid cooling type of applications, from a simple chiller to a very sophisticated data center uh, refrigeration or, or, or liquid cooling type of application, uh, it is a complex process to go through. It's a, it's a more costly process to go through. Yes, it's got a higher capacity, but we have to have a very methodical approach when, once we go from one cooling system to the next, to the next, to the next. And ultimately, obviously, is the cryogenics, as we see it in some of the military applications that, that, are, that are used for uh, phased radar arrays and others that are uh, used by, by cryogenics. So when we look at the cooling options, air cooling, liquid, uh, when we get to the liquid cooling, there's a cold play, thermal siphons, a spray evaporator, jet impingement, boiling. These can also be combined together with others. We get to refrigeration. We have the, uh, the uh, compressed uh, compressor based uh, or the semiconductor TEC, and uh, there is also, as I mentioned, the integrated hybrid that that takes place in this process. So, in this presentation, we're going to focus our attention to the cold plate, and uh, as indicated before, cold plate has room in any of the market sector that I identified here. It all depends upon the power and ultimately the junction temperature requirement that you have in order to make sure that, that you meet the requirement. So what is, what is the liquid cooling perspective? How, how does it work? Uh, if, if you sort of thumb through the internet and you see that, uh, or I should say click through the internet, you, you see uh, so many different cold plate designs, so just just ton of them on the market. But the basic essence is very, very uh, simple that uh, we can obtain lower uh, thermal resistances. No ifs and buts about it. It's certainly cheaper than refrigeration because once I, I, I get rid of the uh, uh, compression cycle in there, it is cheaper. Uh, low pressure fluid that uh, can be used, uh, that's attractive. More complex than certainly air cooling. Uh, leakage can be a problem, therefore it needs to be managed upfront and during the system operations and design, and you cannot overlook this. When you put in liquid in your system, you're dealing with electronics, you're dealing with data centers, you're dealing with uh, uh, customer facility, customer premise. You got to ask the question, if the liquid is discharged from my system, what's going to happen? And you have to answer this question at the design stage. Uh, at the end of the world, there's always a, a sort of a liquid to air uh, heat exchanger or a heat sink. So that your ultimate heat sink is always air. And that's where the heat is being dumped. Uh, and unless you have it funneled to the space, there's no other place to dump it but into the atmosphere. 
Uh, and any uh, liquid cooling system needs a cold plate. The thing that we have to re remember, the cold plate by definition is not a piece of copper or a piece of aluminum that people by mistake refer to it as a cold plate. The proper definition of it is a, a plate that, that has a passage for the fluid to go through. However, that passage is designed, doesn't really matter. That's a design application or specific, but uh, you have to have a, a liquid passage going through, the, uh, through your plate or to in order to be a, be a cold plate and, and part of the liquid cooling system. Uh, uh, when we look at the cold plates, as I mentioned, people again mistakenly refer to the heat pipe as 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 a as a uh, liquid cooling type of a thing. Heat pipe is nothing but a, a thermal transport mechanism that takes the heat from point point A to point B, and then you have to dissipate it here through uh, you know heat, uh, airflow or whatever. This is not the, the, granted. It's liquid going through a pipe, but the design and definition is totally different. Heat pipes are under vacuum. Cold plates are not. It's just a, a liquid loop that we that we see in many applications like this, where we have a tube cold plate. This uh, copper tubing is pressed into the uh, into the uh, or glued into the uh, piece of aluminum or copper, depending depending upon the application. Or you have these uh, uh, these. Uh, uh, cold plate that there's a heat sink inside of it and the fluid goes runs into the heat sink in order to be able to solve it so uh, the basic equation for uh, for uh, calculation of the transport process is very very simple uh, we have a fluid that's coming through the uh, a pipe and we got heat coming in uh, to that pipe and the fluid is leaving the, uh, the pipe with the elevated temperature it's the change of enthalpy of open system across the uh, across this tube so if i put a control volume around uh, around this uh, pipe and apply the first law of uh, thermodynamics this is what i get uh, from the uh, uh, from the equation so the change of enthalpy across it and bear in mind that you also have the, this heat transfer coefficient that's uh, interaction of the fluid with this with this with this wall so uh, cold plate calculations are very standard it's been around for for many 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 years and uh, what we see that the surface temperature can, can be calculated by this equation that you see here. A heat transfer coefficient is given as a function of the uh, uh, nozzle number, thermal conductivity, and the hydraulic diameter. Pressure drop is given by this equation. These are standard equations that are in the textbooks. And this is really, really, really important. I cannot emphasize this, that uh, the pumping power that, that we, we come across plays a huge role in the performance of our uh, of our uh, cold plate and the selection of it, you can see that there is a, a combination of the uh, pressure drop as as well as uh, uh, the uh, volumetric flow rate. Uh, and uh, these parameters, the surface temperature, uh, pumping power, and resistance, are function of the bead, which is the uh, thickness of the wall, the heat transfer, and the uh, fluid velocity. So uh, when we look at it, uh, we have uh, effectively these uh, four, uh, three parameters that we want to be looking at in order to go through the through the process. Uh, obviously, number one is uh, surface temperature. I want to make sure that the surface temperature is going to meet my uh, eventually junction temperature because on top of this device, on, on top of this cold plate, there's going to be a device that needs to be cooled, and this has a junction temperature that I have to manage. So if I know the surface temperature of the cold plate, uh, uh, I, I can I can then back calculate the uh, junction temperature and make sure that it's done. The uh, pumping power it, it is a system design type of issue. How much power do I require to to put this in? And then obviously the resistance is going to give me a guidance as to what's the overall resistance that I have on the on the outside of it. So these two uh, are, are effectively go hand in hand, and this is an important design parameter that we have to worry about. So let's just uh, quickly uh, take these uh, parameters and, and go through the uh, go through the uh, uh, some of the calculations. We've put these into a, uh, obviously a, a solver, if you will, and uh, any of the analytical tools that that is available on the market, Mathematica, MATLAB, Excel, or what have you. And uh, uh, but using the uh, Nusselt number and the friction factor that's available. Uh, we can start uh, doing some calculations and see what the uh, parameters are, what the roles of these are. So um, let's take an application like a uh, cold plate, like what you see here, uh, 100 by 100 by 10. This is a real application, by the way. Uh, one of the projects that we worked on, we were dissipating one kilowatt on this on this uh, cold plate. 
So the objective is to find the surface temperature and, and thermal resistance as a function of channel spacing and volumetric flow rate to see what, 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 what are my options uh, if I use different coolants. Let's say I, I, three, I use uh, three coolants. I use air. Air is a fluid, uh, and it can be certainly be used in cold plate. Compressed air is very attractive if we can design it in such a fashion that uh, we can take the most effect out, out of it. Obviously, the thermal capacitance of water is significantly better than air, so I, I can I can use less water. You can see an example of it, 1.9 gallons per minute versus 126 uh, gallons per minute. And then mercury, uh, which is uh, we use it as a hypothetical. It, it has been used in the past before, especially for very high power devices, but I don't look at it as a fluid, but it's a pumpable uh, uh, metal that we can we can pump across the uh, across the uh, uh, core plate. So uh, you're going to see a number of examples. I'd like to draw your attention to the overall power, and uh, uh, you can see curves that we are changing the uh, the B. This this thickness. How narrow should this uh, this be? And we are looking at either temperature in in this axis, resistance, and also the power consumption that's that needs to be used as a function of given the, the system. So you can see, to keep the surface temperature below 100 degrees C, which is our, our hypothetical ta uh, target, a power of 10,000 watts required, and it's really not practical to do this by air if I have this kind of a power coming on the system because the power consumption is so large that uh, renders the system impractical. But you can see by manipulation of these equations in, in an in a, uh, analytical solver, uh, you can very easily come up with the design curves that are associated with your with your design. And before you jump into an experiment, before you jump into the prototyping, and or jump into your CFD uh, modeling and so forth, you have a very good idea whether it is practical or not. And you can design this, build these design curves, and and go from there. So the next one, uh, uh, core plate uh, thermal resistance, and we can see that uh, uh, with uh, 30 watt pumping power, at best, the thermal resistance that we can get is 1.5 degree C per watt. We know that we can have heat sinks that are with air, with a fan, it is significantly better than one and a half degree C per watt. So it doesn't really make sense to go through a, a cold plate design if that's the resistance that I require or, uh, or uh, that's the resistance I'm gonna be landing with for a 500 watt using air as a, as a coolant inside this cold plate. Mind you, the cold plate looks like this. This is, you've seen a end view of the uh, cold plate, and those are the parameters that are, that are being changed. So you can see how the, uh, the uh, 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 values are of, of the B, the thickness of the channel is changing while we're keeping A as, as constant. So uh, uh, what if we have the same power, 500 watts, and now we use water as a, as a coolant? Uh, we can see that the water is the best heat transfer fluid with 0.2 watts of pumping power. Remember, the other one was 1,000, 10,000, I'm sorry, 10,000, and it's 0.2. It's uh, orders of magnitude lesser than, than what, we, what we saw. Uh, surface temperature of less than 50 degrees C. Our target was 100. We, we were able to re receive 50 degrees C, and the device can be cooled very effectively. So you can see the advantage of a cold plate in association with uh, depending upon the right fluid and so forth. And we can, we can structure it in such a fashion that this part is indeed manufacturable. And I'm gonna talk about manufacturability very quickly. So the next one is, uh, what if we go to 5,000 watts? Now the power increased by, by a factor of 10, uh, and uh, we see that at even 5,000 on this 100 by 100, remember this cold plate was uh, uh, 100 uh, millimeters squared. And if, if I'm dissipating 5,000, our application was 1,000, one kilowatt. I need a pump that's uh, with 60 watts. The surface temperature is less than 100, and as you can see here. And uh, this is a very attractive proposition, so I can really push my design to a level that uh, it is suitable for this, for this application. So the cold plate thermal, thermal resistance is, is giving me a very attractive uh, thermal resistance of 0 0.015 degrees, uh, degrees C per watt, which is very attractive. And uh, achieving this by air, it can be done, but uh, it, it cannot be done in a 100 by 100 uh, uh, squared millimeter. You, have, you need a significantly larger heat sink with uh, multiple fans and so forth to make it, make it work. But it can be done. This is still in the range that is very doable with, with air, depending upon whether we can design it or not. So, 
you have to make a decision at this juncture. Uh, now, what is the site implementation? What are the customers? What if there is a leakage sprung in the in the uh, utilization of the pro of the of the device? What am I going to see? What is going to happen? And those are the questions that that uh, that is really. Uh, the deployment uh, questions that it's very important that we have to uh, consider and answer, uh, but uh, it, it tells us that from the design standpoint, we can have a coal plate with a very no nice uh, small resistance that we can we can work. And that's part of the motivation, by the way, we calculate the uh, uh, thermal resistance of the of the uh, coal plate in order to make sure that we can, uh, if we have to go with the option of air, is it feasible? Is it possible to do it? And it certainly uh, it stays so that it is. So if you go with mercury, you can see that with the power dissipation, if you can pump mercury, is about 0 0.1 uh, watts. And the temperature is certainly below uh, 500 degrees C for 500 watt. Very doable process. Now you have the issue of the mercury. Where, what's attractive with mercury, for instance, you may have an ambient that is uh, significantly sub-zero. <coughs> As, as we've seen with some of the applications that goes into uh, uh, very cold climates on, on Earth or uh, space applications where the temperature is uh, significantly sub-zero, near absolute zero. So what if we have 5,000 watts? And, and again, the, the same cold plate. And uh, now with the cooling flow is, is mercury, and we can see where it lands us here with one and a half watt of pumping power. It's very, very attractive. I don't need a big pump in order to be able to uh, to uh, uh, pump this through. And you can see for some of the applications like space, where the weight is of significant importance or avionics where the weight is significantly important. Even today with uh, with uh, electric vehicles, uh, lighter your cooling system, um, but longer the life, life of your battery. So uh, you can potentially get away with a very, very small pump in comparison to using water that requires a larger pump but you're pumping mercury. You have other, all other uh, issues associated with that. But certainly meeting the temperature requirement, meeting the power requirement, these are very attractive proposition. We have an option, should we go in that direction. Uh, now the, uh, the thermal resistance, you can see it is a factor of two better than what we had with the water when the power dissipation is 5,000 watts. So I hope you're getting the sense of the, the direction and the process that you go through, the iterative process that you have to go through uh, to make sure that this is working properly for you in the, in the design process. So uh, the, some of the design objectives that we want to go through, uh, say the device is 500 watts uh, uh, and uh, the power dissipation. And uh, we want uh, our objective is a surface temperature to be less than 100 degrees C. Remember, all of these calculations are done, if I could back, work backwards, uh, are done based on these analytical models. This is a very simple model that you put into your Excel or, or whatever uh, solution you have. And uh, you, you have the different heat transfer coefficient model. You might have a different Nusselt number, different num model for the friction factor. And you can generate these curves yourself. You don't need us. You don't need anybody else. Um, if you are training the field, uh, you can certainly do this uh, very effectively yourself and, and develop the design parameters that you need. So we're looking at the surface temperature as a function of different fluids. And uh, and you can see where we land with this. The power dispersion is five, uh, 500. I want to make sure that we're we below 100. And you can see the air is just not, not feasible at all. But certainly water and mercury is going to do the job for us. And we need to make sure that we are at the right uh, uh, dimensional size. Again, this, the, the, the width, of, we're talking about millimeters, by the way. This is 0.1 millimeter, and I want to be closer to a one to make the, the part more cost effectively manufacturable. If I go to, to many channels, not micro channels, I'm talking about many channels that are in the order of uh, a, a half a millimeter, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 millimeter to uh, one millimeter, my manufacturing cost to produce these is going to be significantly lesser. If I go to micro channels below you know, 80, 90, uh, or, or 50 microns, not that cannot be done. We've done it. Others have done it. It becomes a very costly uh, process to, uh, to fabricate those. Uh, now, surface temperature with uh, 5,000 watts of power uh, uh, in here. And again, the same thing with uh, with, the, with these uh, three different fluids that as, as we use as a sort of the uh, lower and upper type of capabilities. We continue to see that air and uh, and I'm sorry, uh, water and uh, mercury do a very very good job. 
but there are some aspects of the uh, water that we have to be careful with. Uh, we can see that the water can achieve acceptable surface temperatures at the size of the micro channels, which is again making the cost not very cost effective to fabricate. Mercury can achieve surface temperature of less than 100 degrees C with mini channels, and that's a, that could be a deciding factor depending upon the cost of your product and the cost of deployment. This is something that uh, that uh, it is very very important to to consider as we come across a multitude of uh, uh, OEMs and and clients uh, across the globe, and I do not recall a one occasion that uh, there was not a cost discussion. Uh, for the product uh, that is being designed or developed, or uh, for this for, for their application, There's, everybody is very concerned and, and uh, cautious about the excess cost of the system. And uh, this also is, is a very instructive uh, uh, panel that shows the uh, pumping power required, because there is one other aspect of it that we have to do, we have to remember. Many many uh, system uh, OEMs. Uh, they are not only concerned about the absolute cost of their of their uh, product. They are also concerned about the cost of deployment. Cost of deployment means from the uh, incept of acquiring, shipping to the customer site, all the way to disposal of it after X years when the life of the product is over. And in the interim, the cost of operation. If I have a system that, that requires awful lot of power, remember this is a logarithmic, and uh, the, the, it goes up very rapidly. Uh, not logarithmic, but uh, goes up very rapidly, uh, and this can become very costly to operate the system at that at that level. And you want to keep it as low as possible. So, from the deployment standpoint, is an attractive proposition for for usage. So, this chart with the manipulation of those equations that I showed you, uh, we can come up with a design that is in the suitable range that we can we can deploy our system and select the right fluid, select the right. Uh, uh, channel design that is cost effective for production and be able to deploy it into our into our system now all along if i didn't bore you to death with all these numbers and data i hope it, it, I, I was able to convey the message to you that uh, a simple analytical model before we jump into cft which is a wonderful tool uh, it, it provides you with a significant details in design and with uh, simple uh, parametric analyses, you're able to de develop charts like this for your application to see where you land on your on your uh, coal plate. But the basic equations and the fundamentals, uh, it's not our invention. It's been in the literature for years, uh, for many, many decades. And it's a very powerful tool and it's very effective. And as you're going to see, there's a very, very good agreement between uh, uh, the analytical modeling and the CFD uh, modeling. But all along, what we've made an assumption and something that a lot of us forget is we, we assume that the power is uniformly distributed over the surface. In reality, we know that the, the, our heat sources are in a smaller uh, footprint than our uh, cold plate or our heat sink. So uh, we, there, there are a number of parameters that we have to, uh, we have to consider here. Uh, for instance, we were talking about 0 0.007 degrees C per watt of a thermal resistance. This is talking about the thermal resistance of this box, the box itself. I have a device that sits on top of it. I have uh, contact resistance. I have interfacial resistance. Uh, and uh, also, very important parameter, which is the largest resistor, I have spreading resistance. If I don't manage my spreading resistance, I can I can be shooting for a 0 0.007, but my spreading resistance could be 0 0.12, could be 2 degrees C per watt, depending upon your application, how your system is set up. You must understand and put, uh, uh, put uh, spreading resistance into your calculations when you go through the design cycle. So let me spend a few slides uh, to uh, talk about the uh, spreading resistance. As many of you know, when there is a dissimilarity between the uh, heat sink, whether a cold plate or a heat sink, and the heat source, when there's an area difference, you're going to have a spreading, if you will, the heat has to make a turn here to go, uh, to go this way and eventually go up. There is a, there's a resistance associated with this. Uh, I'm, I'm making it very uh, 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 commonly, if you will, by making this, this bend. And this resistance or uh, resistor associated with that must be accounted for and must be minimized in that process. When you look at the equation for spreading resistance, many researchers, there are numerous models in the literature. If you, if you look at it, uh, you, you see it. But in general, it's a function of the area of the heat source, uh, the base thickness, 
uh, heat transfer coefficient, effective heat transfer coefficient, and the thermal conductivity. So heat source area, uh, the smaller area, the higher the resistance. Conductivity of the base thickness K is lower R, almost uh, 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 goes to, uh, uh, to uh, reach the same as one over K. Area ratio, uh, which is very important, if the number of uh, 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 if the number is approaching one, the spreading resistance is zero. That's as we talked about it before. The smaller the area, larger the uh, larger the uh, spreading resistance. Heat transfer coefficient above the base plate, uh, higher h, lower lower r, and h goes to infinity. We get to the conduction level. So thickness of the base plate, uh, higher the, the thickness, lower r. So you can see that. There are a number of parameters that we have to play with in order to make sure that our spreading resistance is minimized. This is after the fact that we've addressed the issue of the uh, interfacial resistances between the heat source and the heat sink or the coal plate. So there's some data to just give you a sense of uh, what is happening. If I look at the uh, length of the heat source divided by the length of the base plate as, as 1 over 8, as we change the number, as you can see, uh, as the side gets closer and closer to each other, our spreading resistance gets smaller. But look at the values, right? We, we were talking about 0.22, and if I get it larger to 0 0.5, so I can mitigate this somehow by increasing the thermal conductivity of, of my base if I can't do anything with the heat source. Uh, the heat source and the heat, uh, uh, the base plate, you can see as a function of the thermal conductivity, this is for aluminum. Look at look at what it is. Look at for copper. It is uh, 0 0.125, and I get to diamond, which is about 4,000 uh, watts per meter or 2,000. I think it's 4,000 watts per meter uh, degree K. It gets very very small. Obviously, I cannot uh, unless the application is uh, very very unique, like uh, space applications. Uh, the, coating the uh, surface with diamond is not a really a practical application. So people try to go with a with a copper or some combination of the copper and vapor chamber to in order to, to get into, into this kind of a level. Even at this level, you can see this is about 0 0.07. Uh, this is comparable to the resistance of the, uh, of the uh, I'm sorry, factor of 10 higher than the resistance of the coal plate of uh, 7 thousandths that we saw for mercury. So uh, the, 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 my point is you cannot ignore the spreading resistance when you design these uh, applications in order to make sure that the problem is uh, satisfactorily addressed. Uh, and uh, when we look at the convection, obviously, uh, the convection does play a significant role. Uh, for me to get to this level of convection, uh, you know, typically air applications, if we go to jet impingement and so forth, we are lucky to be around uh, uh, 1,000 watt per square centimeter. Most fan-based type of applications if the system is designed properly, we are around between um, 90 to about 110, 120. So when we when we're looking at the, you know uh, something like 20,000 uh, or more, this is a major major undertaking to get to this level of H. You are here. In most applications, you are at this level, and you can see uh, what the effect of the resistance is at this level. It's very very large in comparison to what we saw with the coal plates. Now, uh, the thickness of the coal plate is, is certainly very, very important. This is a, a work that was uh, done by Intel and Thermocore, I believe, to uh, 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 spreading resistance of, of, uh, of a vapor chamber, for instance, is 0 0.058 uh, uh, degree C per watt or K per watt. Same size copper plate with five millimeter thickness is 0 0.78. If I th increase this thickness, now remember what we were talking about here as far as the uh, impact of the thickness is concerned. Uh, uh, one, one, of these, one of these charts. Uh, it shows that we are as, at the same level as the, as the, uh, uh, as the uh, uh, vapor chamber. The vapor chamber is a wonderful product. It's got a lot, a lot of capabilities. We certainly design and, and fabricate them. But uh, th there are some uh, issues associated with it as far as you have a a liquid uh, embedded uh, enclosure that has all kinds of uh, uh, concerns associated with that, and we try to address those concerns the best that we can. But that aside, you can see that by, by, by me increasing the thickness of the base plate, I can get to very close to, uh, to what I have with uh, vapor chamber. Now, uh, the issue that I have, now I have a brick sitting on my component. 
uh, 10 millimeter thick copper is not a trivial uh, problem to see and uh, to manage from the mechanical packaging standpoint, any kind of a shock and vibration, anything that we have to do with respect to motion and also the compression on the component and so forth makes it makes an impact. That's one of the reasons that people go to vapor chamber uh, and, and because it's very thin, light, and has a very nice uh, effective thermal conductivity as far as the uh, size is concerned. And this is a work that was done by Intel. As, as you can see, as you increase the thickness uh, of the base, there is a point of uh, uh, diminishing return, but you can get very comparable to what you see in the, uh, in the uh, uh, performance between a vapor chamber and uh, uh, thickening the base. And so there is a, there is a really design consideration, uh, reliability, uh, packaging, uh, life, transportation, etc., 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 to be able to say, okay, I'm going to go with the solid copper, or I'm going to uh, spend the extra money and get a vapor chamber because of the fact I cannot tolerate those uh, mechanical damages that could possibly occur as a result of the excess weight. And um, this is a, a numerical simulations that we did for uh, for uh, uh, looking at the 10 millimeter space on over 80 when the base is uh, five millimeters thick, which is a pretty thick type of a uh, either a heat sink or a cold plate base uh, for for the application. When we assume that the, the uh, heat transfer coefficient on the top was very high, around 4,000 watt, uh, watt uh, per meter squared, and as you can see, a bulk of the uh, uh, spreading occurs. Uh, in about 10 millimeters of this device. So from here to here, as I, I am not really good with uh, using this uh, mouse to draw the lines, you can see that the bulk of, bulk of the uh, spreading resistance is occurring at that, at that level. So the numerical modeling is also verifying that uh, for me to be able to mitigate the spreading resistance, I got I got to do something in this in this level. What I do here at, at at this location at this location doesn't really have that much of an impact. But if I go to the uh, uh, near the vicinity of the device and treat this somehow with uh, additional thickness, higher conductivity material, uh, or etc. etc. etc., I can minimize my spreading resistance. Bear in mind, cold plates, heat sinks. If you don't address the spreading resistance, you've, you've, you've missed a big parameter in your design and could cause all kinds of issues for you. So uh, we did an experimental and, and a computational verification. You, you can see the, the dimensions that are given here. And um, it, this is a very narrow uh, channel heat uh, cold plate. Uh, it's almost more, it's not really, it's more of a mini channel than a micro channel. But you can see it's only two millimeters in height, 0.62. And you can see the dimensions that are given. And we did this, did this with water, 100 watts, and uh, a variety of uh, volumetric flow rates. And uh, the objective was uh, to see whether we can we can verify this analytical and, and experimental versus CFT as well. So prior to CFT analysis, uh, uh, a solid model needs to be to be generated. Uh, water enters from the inlet and, and into the pipe, and and you can see that that gets across and goes out in this direction. Uh, there are uh, lateral fins uh, here that that helps with the cooling uh, of the of the uh, cold plate. Water flows laterally towards the exit uh, from here. Ob obviously, there are a lot of design issues associated with the pressure drop calculations and so forth because you do not want to have all the flow come in this direction and go out this way. You want to have a very uniform uh, uh, flow of the fluid from from left to right, and that's uh, part of the design process. And then eventually water that's heated with the elevated temperature of your cold plate exits from this location. Uh, the results of CFT shows the maximum temperature is 47.2 at 229.0 uh, millimeters per second of water flow that was about 0.1 liter. Inlet water temperature is 30 degrees C, power is 100, thermal resistance is 0.7. Uh, we used uh, CF design uh, to do these calculations. There are other tools like Six Sigma and so forth that, that, that are very effective in um, doing the modeling for these types of problems. Uh, effective flow rate, uh, we can see that uh, the uh, results showed from CFD, maximum temperature is 33.4 at 2676 or 1.2 liters. So effectively, if I, increase the, uh, 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 if I increase the flow rate by a factor of 10, I can reduce my temperature by about uh, 13 degrees. So it's not a one-to-one -one type of relationship that I increase my, my flow by a factor of 10, my temperature is going to drop by a factor of 10. 
So you can see ten, uh, tenfold increase in, in volumetric flow rate resulted in 25% temperature reduction. And uh, so here is a comparison between uh, uh, experimental analytical modeling and CFD. And you can see there's a great agreement between the two. If you had participated in my previous uh, webinars, I had mentioned that we need to be within the maximum of 20%. And you can see there's a great agreement at, at lower velocity. When we get to a little bit uh, uh, higher velocity, we see some differences here, about 20%. Uh, these are certainly okay. This is certainly okay. This is certainly okay. And we need to understand exactly what happened at this flow rate. But overall, you can see that there's a very good agreement between analytical modeling uh, experimental and CFD. So uh, this is a sort of the testimony to the models that we had that we use in the design of the coal plate. And if you do the right CFD, right boundary conditions, you're going to get the uh, you're going to get the uh, uh, appropriate results. Now, the, but the point that I mentioned, uh, now you have developed confidence in your CFD, uh, you can now use the CFD model to make sure <clears throat> that the design of the fins. Uh, the location of the exhaust, the way the flow is being distributed, the temperature profile of the flow within the fin field, uh, or whatever your, your configuration is inside, is done properly, and CFD is a great tool. And, and as I said, we, we've used uh, uh, both CF Design and Six Sigma, and we're getting some very, very good results with both uh, software tools. I'm very happy with Six Sigma. Uh, I don't mean to plug for them. I'm just sharing you my, my experience that, that uh, we have had with, uh, with both software tools. Uh, we do a lot of ex uh, testing and, and validation at ATS. We have a number of uh, labs here. Uh, we have two dedicated thermal labs for a variety of testing uh, and, and simulation and experimentation. This is one of the test rigs that <clears throat> we've put together to test our heat exchangers as well as our cold plates that you can see here. It, it, has, a, it has a pump. It has a, a flow meter. It has a reservoir with a relief uh, valve or a release valve. Uh, a cold plate with a heat source that we can we can put a variety of power in there, and a very obviously in this case very large heat exchanger. We can change the heat exchanger readily to a, a smaller one if we have to test it, and with the with the pressure uh, pressures and so forth. So here we can very accurately uh, measure, uh, determine the performance, and and see what the uh, what the performance of the heat exchanger is, and as well as the cold plate. In addition to that, uh, we've developed uh, this product called iFlow 200 which is dedicated exclusively for, uh, uh, for uh, thermal evaluation and testing of the cold plates, where you plug in your cold plate here. And this is the electronics uh, box of the, of the uh, unit. And this is the hydraulic box. Obviously, they're not in the, in the same. They're separated in case of a leakage. We've been very, very concerned. And the software is uh, developed to do the, all the uh, testing automatically. Once you plug it in, you push the button, you walk away. And the beauty of the software is, once we develop uh, this for the uh, uh, distilled water that we use as, as a point of reference in our, in, our, in our characterization, the software can do this for about eight or nine other uh, uh, fluids. So you have a detailed characterization of your cold plate as a function of uh, different fluid types that you have to use. So there are testing capabilities, but you can certainly put the system together yourself uh, or a system like this that uh, we've designed over the years uh, as a very effective means of uh, doing the thermal characterization of the cold plates. So with that, let me uh, uh, just highlight some some uh, some thoughts. The device life doubles for every 10 degrees C junction temperature reduction. Designers, uh, uh, designer has has to predict the junction temperature within reasonable accuracy. And and uh, I can emphasize on this. If you're a, if you're a uh, pardon my my bluntness, if you're a th real thermal engineer. Uh, not, not somebody who's dabbles in and out. Uh, if, if this is your passion and this is the kind of work that you do, you cannot take, uh, from my perspective, uh, junction temperature lightly. You have to pay a lot of attention to calculate junction temperature accurately in order to make sure that you have a, you have a right design. Uh, over or under design cooling system because of the poor junction temperature calculation kills your product. As simple as that. You, can, you cannot either ship it because of the fact you underdesigned it. If you overdesigned it because of the poor junction temperature calculation, you have increased the cost of your system dramatically. And also deployment, et cetera, et cetera. Power dissipation is going to rapidly challenge the uh, thermal designers to seek high capacity cooling and certain liquid cooling. And the design of the cold plate has to be part of our uh, tool set. 
I don't I do not recommend despite the fact that we design and, and, and fabricate and uh, produce all kinds of innovative cold plates and so forth I do not recommend jumping into liquid cooling without you've you've exhaustively addressed the issue of cooling your system with by air air cooling is significantly cheaper more reliable uh, more effective once you exhausted that you've come to a conclusion that uh, no it cannot be done by air as you, you saw the examples that I showed you then liquid cooling is an option that you have to go through and you need to be versed in, in the design and selection of the uh, uh, cooling system by liquid. Uh, conventional air cooling is getting close to, to the, its limits for some of the applications. And then as we just talked about this thing, liquid cooling is needed, needed for the next generation of processors and air cooling is not adequate as we march forward. Uh, as I spent a good chunk of time on the spreading resistance, this is, I cannot, uh, uh, emphasize the importance of a spreading resistance. Forget about liquid cooling, forget about air cooling. If you're doing thermal management, you're, you're selecting some sort of a cooling solution for your application. If you're not addressing uh, the spreading resistance and its value in your calculations, you're not a real engineer, real thermal engineer. And, and this is very, very important. I cannot be more, more blunt. Micro and mini channel cold plates using liquids are uh, viable techniques for high heat flux uh, devices and also junction temperature management. Uh, from moderate heat flux to about 1000 watt per square centimeter, water is still the best thermal uh, transport fluid. Uh, water has other implications, but from the thermal standpoint, it's the best heat transfer fluid. For every high heat flux, uh, liquid metals such as mercury are, are good candidates. These are very, very high heat fluxes that we're talking about. You saw 5000 uh, uh, watts on a 100 by 100 uh, millimeter uh, box. And that's the kind of a thing that you have to really start looking at it. Not necessarily the heat flux. What is the temperature that you're trying to get? The objective of that exercise that we went through was for us to get to 100 degrees C. And otherwise, we could have used water very effectively. Simple analytical tools can be used uh, to investigate the uh, perf uh, performance of the cold plates with a reasonable engineering accuracy that gives you a good guidelines to be able to uh, 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 to design this in an effective fashion. Over the years, we've looked at the ferrofluids as, as, a, as a heat transfer fluid and also the use of the magnetic field in order to be able to move the, move the uh, fluid around. It is not a trivial task. There are some companies who've done it. Uh, I, do not, I do not know of any product out there that has a ferrofluid, but it's certainly a very attractive option if you can address the issue of the uh, pulsation of the magnetic field in order to be able to circulate your uh, ferrofluid inside the cold plate. Uh, also, another important thing is, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, at the end of the line, at the end of the world, there is a liquid to air heat exchanger that you have to, you have to have, whether you call it the heat exchanger or you call it the heat sink or whatever, however your design configuration is, <coughs> you need to be able to address this unless you have a big pool of water like ocean or a lake or some, some fluid reservoir that you can put a heat exchanger in there, uh, 80, 90 percent of the uh, uh, liquid cool systems eventually dump that heat into the into the uh, air that surrounds the system. What's the implication of this thing? You have to know what the size of that heat sink or heat exchanger is. Otherwise, your cooling system, your liquid cooling system, is not going to work effectively. Your your biggest resistor per se, or your business biggest uh, block is that heat exchanger at the end of the line. And uh, as I've always mentioned, and I continue to mention every opportunity I get. When you go through the thermal design, uh, please, please do yourself a favor and always start with analytical model. It is, we're not selling a software tool. It's not our, our thing, it's your thing. Uh, it, it is just a good engineering practice to sit down and model this properly. As you saw the examples, you get a very, very good sense as to what this is all about uh, as far as your problem is concerned. And then when you do your CFD, when you do your experiment, uh, it is a, it is, you're doing it with knowledge versus some ambiguity that's uh, that's out there. When you do analytical models enough, it becomes second nature to you. It's like playing a musical instrument and it becomes very, very convenient and easy to do. And as I mentioned, uh, the uh, iFlow 200 that we've designed for the cold plate analyzer is a really a valuable tool for a lot of applications. I'm not plugging our product. I'm uh, stating that if you need to do thermal characterization of your cold plates or cold plates that you get off the shelf and uh, from the market, this is a very uh, convenient tool to use. It's not, in, it's not uh, inexpensive. It's a very sophisticated system. 
but it is a system that's going to enable you to very quickly quantify the capability of a core plate that you have before you deploy it in your system. So with that, uh, uh, I thank you for your uh, participation and attention. Uh, remember that ATS is a, offers mechanical and design services, cooling solutions, air, liquid, active, and passive, instrumentation and wind tunnels, uh, manufacturing services, uh, training programs, and QPDF.